Good evening. On behalf of the Action Lab, I'd like to welcome you all to the Freedom Forward Film Series, which is a virtual series dedicated to bringing together social impact storytellers, social justice practitioners, and artists dedicated to imagining a world with freedom, justice, and well-being for all people. This evening, we have the great privilege of presenting The Infiltrators by filmmaker Alex Rivera and Cristina Ibarra. The Infiltrators is a docu-thriller that tells the story of young immigrant detainees and how they resist from within. We are really excited to present this sort of genre-defying, you know, innovative and really creative story about how we resist together from within the darkest places. And so we're really, really happy to have this evening Alex Rivera, who is joining us from California, and Marco Saavedra, who is joining us from my hometown and one of my favorite places on earth, the Bronx, New York. We're really excited and we hope that you will enjoy the conversation between Alex and Marco. And we invite you to, to, to use the infiltrators as sort of an opportunity to explore what's possible when we resist not only with our bodies, but also our hearts, our souls, our creativity, um, and everything that is born from the deepest struggles. So I'd like to welcome first, Alex Rivera. Alex is a filmmaker whose work explores globalization, migration, and technology. His work, which crosses genres from fiction to documentary, from installation art to music video, has won multiple awards at the Sundance Film Festival, the Berlin International Film Festival, the Black Star Film Festival, and has been screened all over the world. He is a 2021 MacArthur Fellow, and we are so blessed to have him with us this evening. Welcome, Alex. Hi, thanks so much for having me. I'm super um, grateful and excited and to be here. Thank you. I'd also like to welcome artist activist Marco Saavedra, who was born in San Miguel in the indigenous Mixteca Baja region of Oaxaca. Marco is a Bronx organizer, artist. He is, his family's Michelin listed Oaxacan restaurant La Morada began a mutual aid kitchen where they've been providing community, fields, community meals daily, right? Over 600 meals a day. And so Marco is depicted in this film um, and in 2021 was granted political asylum, setting a precedent for immigrant advocates who face disappearance and death for their work in Mexico. Welcome, Malco. So this evening's conversation will be, you know, essentially a conversation between both Alex and Marco. Um, I think we're having some technical difficulties uh, bringing Marco on, but we're going to wait patiently. And um, Alex, while we wait for Marco, I guess what is most exciting for you looking back on this film? What well, do you most think, particularly given, well, particularly given the political moment that we're living in and sort of shifts um, shifts and or um, maybe the strengthening, right, of U.S. immigration policy, which actually harms immigrants and migrants. Um, what do you think is the significance of having this, this film sort of for this audience this evening? Um, and yeah. what do you think is the role for you as an artist or, you know, for yourself, but artists like you who want to use stories to kind of inspire and also... Um, Help us to reimagine what resistance looks like. Yeah, sure. Well, well, well thank you once again for having having me and having the uh, having this film in conversation. I'm grateful for it because it's a slightly old film. The film premiered back in uh, in 2019, and then of course it depicts events that happened, um, you know, o almost uh, 10 years ago or over 10 years ago, uh, in the middle of the Obama administration, and. Um, and so in terms of what I'm excited about, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that the film is alive and being used. It's, it's an honor and a delight. And then <clears throat> I think also where we're at politically, we're right in the middle of obviously Biden's first term. Um, since this film was made, we you know, went through the, uh, there was the Obama administration, obviously Trump. Um, and through all of this, you know, immigration has always been central. The border has always been central. Um, both Christina and my partner and I, we see the border not as like the 
perimeter or the exterior of the country, but a, as a kind of center, as a sort of nuclear core, a fusion core in the heart of the nation, in the heart of our nation's imagination. And um, that really ruptured through during the Trump years. Um, and there was so, you know, obviously so much, um, whether it was the people rallying at airports or, um, you know, the, uh, the making, uh, you know, noise and just, you know, uh, decrying the family separations. The Trump era was this era of like very active, um, you know, focus on the border because it was such a focus explicitly for Trump, even though Obama deported more people, right? Like the contours of what's happening versus what the optics are, are um, very complicated. And I think we're in a sort of indetermined moment right now um, in the middle of the Biden administration. And uh, so I think it's like a great moment to look back. And the film is a way of, I think, both looking back at that moment, looking back at strategies that that were very effective during the Obama years and uh, opening up, hopefully, a conversation about what's um, what's what's possible now. So I don't know if we have Marco on because he's really the the one who could speak to all this. But I just want to see if he's with us. We've actually lost Marco again. Um, oh no! Okay. He was with well, us momentarily. I, <laughs> yeah, and I can also just say, like, so to me, the film is obviously about these topics, but it's also wrapped in another struggle, which is a struggle of uh, Latino people to express ourselves in the medium of film. You know, and to me, I'm <clears throat> always kind of looking at the world with a sort of split point of view, looking at the the lived reality of my familia, my community, the people around me and um i grew up with undocumented family members i grew up with first generation immigrant uh family members and um really since the 90s those people have been in a crosshairs politically so that's like one thing i'm looking at but then the idea of turning those stories into film puts you in a whole other set of challenges which is the film industry the film funding world um that world is um <clears throat> full of other types of borders and barriers and um, and so this is there's, there's all kinds of crazy tech stuff happening on my screen here. But um, but in any case, I mean, this film to me was a kind of miracle because it managed to look at, uh, like you were saying in your in your um, introduction, Marie Nieves, about, you know, people inside a detention center resisting. This is not a it's not a, a family comedy. It's not a rom com. It's not a. It's not a hip hop musical about Hamilton. This is like looking straight at the dark, you know, some it's a subject matter that we don't really see, but it's trying to use the form in very, you know, hopefully innovative and creative ways to kind of dodge some of those borders to try to bring that story um, in, in onto the screen. And, um, and it's, a, those are challenges that persist, um, you know, today and there's like basically the challenge of immigration is still obviously um front and center and has not gotten better over the decade since these actions unfolded and separately and in parallel the challenges around getting authentic deep soulful progressive politically sharp representations of our community onto the the screen that remains a sort of entrenched problem. So I feel like our community faces this sort of dual invisibility. It's like into detention centers, deported, family separation on the ground, and separately, you don't get to tell your stories, a silencing. And so, um, you know, to me, in terms of what I'm excited about with the film and this moment, is despite all that, we're not done. You know, despite all that, we're still here. Yeah. Despite all that, there's still, um, you know, a, a, a lot of fight in all of us. We see it in our families, in our communities. And, um, and so hopefully, um, you know, it, it, this, this film is just one little, one step on a long journey towards a place called justice for all of us. You know? Thank you so much. And I see that Marco joined, but I want to, you know, I just want to add that I, I worked in an immigrant community for over 12 years. And I, the thing that I love most about this film and that one of the reasons we we're so excited to screen it is really that you're bringing visibility to uh, a sort of a collective trauma that is, 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 is invisibilized, right, beyond the moment of detention, right? 
um, we, we, we don't, we hear so much or we see that most of the, the imagery that is shared like across the news is, you know, we see, we see folks in deportation centers, but those, those, those individuals, those lives are not necessarily fully represented, right? There's a flattening of the human experience in that and what we see through media. Um, and, and of course we see, you know, the traumatic images of when folks are detained and or deported. Um, and so I thought it was so interesting, right, that you decided to, use, to to create a docu-thriller of all things, right, to integrate real documentary footage um, while still representing truly like the horror that is detention, right? Because it's ultimately, it's, it's a horror um, that, that challenges and violates our collective humanity, our human family, um, and certainly the individual lives of the people who are forced to live under those conditions, right? Um, so with that, I wanna welcome Marco. Marco, thank you so much for being with us. And I'm gonna leave yeah, you all- Thank you so much. It. The most exciting part <laughs> is that you get to talk to each other now and reflect back on this work, on this on this incredible work. So thank you both again for being with us on behalf of the Action Lab. Um, and we, we urge our audiences to really just, you know, sit, sit with this film, sit with this art. Um, and, and enjoy our speakers. We will see you next month on February 7th, where we will be screening Sementi's Black Women in Power. We will have filmmakers Julia Mariano and Ethel Oliveira, and they will be moderated by Afro-Dominican filmmaker Loira Limbal. So we hope that you'll join us again on February 7th. Again, welcome Alex and Marco, and thank you all for joining us for the Freedom Forward film series. Beautiful. Well, thank you again. And can you hear me okay, Marco? Yes, I'm sorry, I'm kind of like off camera, I'm trying to like adjust. Oh. <laughs> it's all right, this is the, it's the times we live in. Um, yeah, so, you know, I, I don't know if you caught much of the dialogue already, um, but basically, you know, I thought maybe we'd start off, I, I wanted to start off by kind of like um, rejecting uh, the idea that this is a film that has, um, you know, that, that comes from um, our imaginations, the filmmakers, you know, that sometimes you'll say, oh, it's a creative, because it mixes, um, you know, dramatic footage or recreated footage, scripted footage with documentaries. And um, I always, I mean, I love it when people say anything kind about the film, of course. But the word creativity to me is implies something that comes from nothing, that you're creating. And really, the way I work and, and what I always feel like I'm doing is kind of reacting, synthesizing. Um, and that was the creative process of this film was one of reaction and synthesis. And we were reacting as filmmakers to the story um, you lived, Marco, that, that you and your, you know, and, and, and the rest of the members of the National Immigrant Youth Alliance lived. Um, and, you know, I spent about two years filming with the, with the organization, which started with these more traditional kind of sit-in actions. And then like two years down the timeline, the organization had evolved to, to be ready to do this infiltration of going into detention on purpose. And when you all did that, it created problems for us filmmakers visually. Uh, as we were able to film with you while you were preparing uh, for the infiltration, but not once you went in. And so as filmmakers, it was like the audacity and the creativity um, of the movement created uh, challenges for us um, that we had to react to. And by reacting, um, using actors to depict what we couldn't film, um, ended up making this film that was this kind of strange Frankenstein and looks creative or it looks um, innovative. But it, in, in, to me, it's really um, the truth of it is it was in reaction to, um, to your creativity. So I thought anyways, we would start off, I was just curious about like, if that, um, I guess if that sounded right to you and if you could talk about maybe the creativity of the movement um, in reaction to the immigration enforcement system, which is a very, it's maybe not the right word creative, it's a very inventive system, putting up walls, putting up detention centers, deporting people. This is a system that is constantly changing, constantly improvising, has a very dark, obviously violent um, impulse, but is always shifting and, and, and what I saw in your and the movement's creativity was a reaction to that. So I thought maybe could you just I got start by think just I was curious just to hear your thoughts on the creativity of the movement. 
Yeah, thank you, Alex. Thanks for inviting me and, and having me join you. Um, I think that was like a very significant question because, I mean, you, you said it yourself, like the system of immigration enforcement is so nightmarish and so it's so um, incredible um, that and but at the same time, it is like an untenable reality, especially when you were deporting a thousand people every day from our communities. Um, this was 10 years ago, obviously, like our numbers are different now, but the enforcement is still there. Um, that you had to react and imagine a new reality, right? Uh, and so that's kind of where organizing ki kind of became the um, the platform or the creative outlet for us to express like that hurt, that rage, that frustration, but also kind of imagine and build something new. Um, and so it just, it started as a response and reaction, but it also became very much about agency and it became very emancipatory to buy organizing and taking up civic action you know creating our own freedom um and, and i think that's echoed in the film right then therefore like you had to be creative in how you depicted those stories and followed us for almost a decade and kind of showed how we evolved as people and then also as our organizing also escalated um so so i think that's true and i mean for me also as personally as an artist i mean that was uh very freeing um, and that still carries on to, to today. Like, obviously we've gone through the Trump era now and now under the Biden administration. And obviously like there's still a lot of immigration enforcement, deportation. I mean, the border was just like the closure was re-extended and it just takes on different forms, but then that therefore means that your organizing has to change, shift and take on different forms. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could talk like a little bit about the, um, in, in terms of this idea of like the, the, um, the shape shifting that the system is changing and then your tactics as organizers changing. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about like how you, you all made the shift from doing sort of traditional, what I would call anyways, like a traditional civil disobedience, like sitting in a politician's office, sitting in a street, um, going to jail uh, intentionally, but with in case uh, in the movement's case, the, the, the difference of being undocumented. Right. And so when you get, taken in um, by the police, there's that question of what will happen. But how did you shift from that in, into the idea of infiltrating? And I, I remember stories about like basically being, being locked up and starting to see a strange type of like organizing opportunity inside, right? Like when you were going through the system as a result of that sort of first wave uh, traditional civil disobedience. Is that right? Is that could, I was wondering if you could describe that moment of inflection when the light bulb went off, like, oh, maybe, maybe there's work to be done inside. Yeah, I mean, I think collectively as a movement, I think we were growing and responding. And obviously, this was almost also in the early days of, of social media. So, um, so uh, I mean, a lot of um, walls are coming down, right? Like we could talk across state lines. We didn't have to be in person to communicate and organize and plan. Um, so, and then also we were learning from one another. So like we, um, I mean, I think the, the first way people got into organizing was obviously the urgency of it. Like people were being detained in Greyhounds and um, at border checkpoints. And so therefore like those dreamer stories started to leak and right and online organizing became a platform for folks to like mount like campaigns um and each time there was a campaign you learned oh this this worked out like this representative's office was responsive this ice contact is the right target to direct this email chain to um and that again kept on growing like proactively in our lobbying for the dream act for legalization for immigrant youth like immigrant student youth like ourselves we're not youth anymore. Um, but then at the same time, also reactively to like people that were detained and being deported. Um, and, and all of that knowledge just kind of grew and grew. And so therefore, yeah, when we started to do civil disobedience for the Dream Act and also against deportations, we realized that like the publicity of our actions gave us some safety and, and therefore we weren't being transferred over to ICE. And we kept on just pushing the envelope. How much can we do? I mean, at the same time, you know, we were young 20 year olds, like very reckless and and really angry to take our freedom. And so uh, so I was first arrested in the summer of 2011, graduating from college, um, protesting outside of the DNC, Obama's record number of deportations and also his failure to deliver on the DREAM Act. 
Um, and I wasn't transferred over to ICE, but I was given an alien number. And so we were just like, how can we keep on pushing the envelope, pushing the envelope? And every time we fought one individual immigration um, case, uh, we got like 12 or 20 more that some of which we couldn't fight, some of which like were already on the next flight to be deported. And so obviously like con our response had to escalate too. Like how do we not just fight on these things case by case basis, but how do we like infiltrate a whole detention center? How do we take on a whole detention center as a casework? And so Flo Broward Transitional Center just lined up perfectly because it was a quote unquote low priority detention facility, you know, this model facility that worked financially like was very efficient and uh you know made a lot of money for the geo group and at the same time how so many people that obama was saying he wasn't deported and so we connected with claudio rojas immediately his family and claudio was like who's the main detainee that we connect to and has shown will be shown in this in this film kind of navigated me through that whole detention center while i was there for three weeks making my job like super easy i was almost like useless i think maybe at most i was just kind of like a translator or just communicating information from claudio to our our friends on the outside um uh, I'm, i feel like i'm trailing yeah. now but i think that's yeah, kind of no, like I, I feel like it'll be i think it's exciting in how the film is able to depict that and like for me mm -hmm. it's like all rambled and scattered but at the same time like i think that was part of like the challenge and also the brilliance of the film to depict that oh. Well, it's, 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 you know, I think with any, with any documentary, you're staring at reality and reality is always, you know, uh, borderless. There's no, uh, you know, beginning of an act. There's no scenes. Um, reality is expansive. And, uh, you know, the challenge of storytelling is always coming in and starting to put brackets on things and unfortunately put certain things to the background and bring things forward. And that's kind of, that's kind of the work is giving order to the, the mayhem. And the, the Nia was a wonderful, inspiring, uh, vast uh, mayhem. You know, there was so much um, going on uh, back back in those years. And, um, and it is just, you know, just, I said it earlier, but just to reflect on it with you, Marco, that these events were, you know, were 10 years ago. And, um, you know, I remember, you know, the film premiered under the Trump administration. And um, I guess I'll just talk for a minute because it's, you know, maybe people know, and it's important to say that, um, you know, the film was made to, and at least in, in my my own assessment of it was to try to amplify, document and amplify the work that, that you were doing, you know, um, that, uh, you know, there's always a battle over reality and then there's a battle over the story about reality. And you could see it coming under the Obama years after DACA, it was going to be clear the story that was people were going to try to tell was Obama gave immigrants DACA. And that's like, that was what Obama did. The story of the massive deportations would fall by the sidelines and the story of how Obama had to be pressured to do DACA would fall by the sidelines. And so it was important to me to document the work of, 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 um, of your, of, of the NIA. And, and, um, and so that was like the impulse of it. And what I saw in the work of the NIA was that by telling stories, by becoming public, by organizing, um, building community power, whether it's in you know churches, family units, uh, union, whatever it is, making noise was how the dreamers built power. And that was what we wanted to amplify by making the film and making noise. And so the film premiered at Sundance in 2019, and it's sort of the place you can make the most noise with the film, um, you know, and so the film was in the national news um, and Claudio Rojas, who's like the protagonist of the film you're about to watch, he was in the news. And three weeks later, because it's 2019 under the Trump administration, three weeks later, Trump, um, his ICE in, in Florida uh, detained and deported Claudio. Now, um, you'll see in the film that, you know, a lot about his story, so I won't go fully into it, but um, it was kind of a nightmare. And the intention of the film, which was to amplify these strategies of immigrant power building, seemed to turn upside down during the Trump era. Um, and we learned after that, that our case was not the only one. Obviously, there was in New York City, the case of Ravi Ragbir. Um, there was cases all around the country of undocumented activists speaking out and finding themselves in the crosshairs of, of ICE. And um, 
so I, yeah, I don't, I don't know, Marco, if you wanted to reflect on the strategies of the movement in, um, in the Obama era, what gave, where, what was the vector of power there? Did that change? How did it change under Trump? And then what are you seeing now as the space of possibility? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, um, yeah, I mean, I want to quote, quote Walt Whitman. I mean, the struggle is ever renewed. Um, I mean, Obama still has the record number of deportations for any president. I think um, close to 3 million deportations under his um, under his watch. Um, and I think he just had uh, beat Trump in, his, in numbers just because he was much more effective at saying, I'm just uh, targeting uh, low priority, not low like that he was targeting serious offenders right um and 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 uh, not low priority detainees and that was like him saying it publicly but in reality i mean the dragnet of deportation was extended widely and i think you just saw you know from the bush era in the war on terrorism right um just just ice uh, immigration enforcement just grow exponentially um and they targeting um obviously like the lowest hanging fruit first um people that were recently arrived people with any type of record whether it be uh violent or not um people that were stopped at any t- type of checkpoint i um, mean just being very efficient about it and then when you trump comes into office obviously with much more anti-immigrant rhetoric um but i think at the end of the day much less efficient means by shutting down the border obviously his numbers are going to be uh less high uh, i mean we saw this under the first bush uh, presidency and um bush the father that like raids are just just look really bad on tv right like when you just shut down the border like i mean it's just not as effective as like just uh, coming to someone's house with a search warrant and just doing it like the the cleaner way um and and now under biden i think like i think it's really easy to just become pessimistic right that like um we were talking about this beforehand that like you just see like just a continuum um since the war on terror and also just the explosion of mass surveillance and the police state um, and just a larger and larger waves of stateless people being displaced because of climate change, because of the war in Ukraine, because of Haitian earthquakes, because of um, just just untenability in, in their home nations and right and how we haven't become more humane in our immigration practice, uh, whether it be in America or in Europe. Um, and also the difficulty be, of being a stateless person that we can't have so much solidarity with people in Palestine or Kashmir because every one of us is, is stuck, right? We're unable to to come and go across borders. And so like our movements are very easy to be stymied. Um, mm. so, uh, so I think there's all of that. Uh, but I think if anything, what we showed in the, under the Obama era is that we can really shine light on the hypocrisy and that we just augment any type of accountability, the fact that like you're saying you're not deporting this person and here's a story in front of your face and we can try, try to make as much noise as possible so that it can be you know, in the press, on TV, and therefore, at least with Democrats, you can have some, some type of hopeful accountability, which like just never existed under the Trump administration. And that, I mean, I mean, there's so many ways we can go with this, but I think the more and more I'm in this work or I have seen it now for decades of my lifetime, it's just like, you know, that aphorism of like men make plans and God laughs like, uh, yeah, I mean, Biden just made this announcement right at the border. But I mean, like, I mean, the the droves of thousands and thousands of people, that's just not going to stop. And I think um, our, our reaction is just uh, so much so inhumane and so hypocritical, whether it be Republican or Democrat. Um, and, and, and really where I see the movement ha- be effective and, and work and people that are still in the work is just being hyper local like. You know, my own family now runs a mutual aid restaurant and uh, we've converted our family restaurant into a mutual aid kitchen. So we give out about 600 meals daily. We just did a toy drive for Venezuelan children. Um, we provide mm. like now we take like clothes during the winter. Um, and, and really that like model of mutual aid uh, really boomed during the COVID pandemic because we just saw structural inefficiencies um, in the whole of, of the U.S. And so now the crisis will change, but I think the methods of community organizing, holistic healing, sustainability, and mutual aid, I mean, those will be the correct response and imaginative creativity, regardless of what the crisis is. Well, I think everybody who, who's joined us here has gotten you know, well worth the price of admission, because I think you've covered all of it, right? From using radical public action to, uh, to shame, um, 
hypocrites in office to building sort of autonomous uh, nodes of uh, self-reliance and self-defense in uh, community kitchens. Um, it's really this whole spectrum of uh, visionary work to, to take us to a better world that, that, uh, that I'm hearing from you, Marco. And I hope all the audience there caught that your restaurant is La Morada in the Bronx. Um, can't recommend it highly enough. And then also one sec, I got this book, Marco, also, you know, that this film, of course, is only one of a series of uh, creative, just beautiful, powerful creative work done by and about the radical dreamer movement. So this book is Eclipse of Dreams, the undocumented led struggle for freedom. And Marco is one of the authors of the book, along with a bunch of other artists and activists who recommend the book. And um, just so grateful, uh, the Action Lab, uh, for opening this space. And um, yeah, very just happy to share this movie with you all and hope you enjoy it. The Infiltrators. Thank you. Take it away. I hope everyone <laughs> enjoys it. Right on.